scared everyone into silence, that comment. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think we'll get started. Um, this meeting has a, a narrow agenda, um, which is to say that we are only going to review uh, changes to the RFP, uh, and that's the draft that Nate sent around uh, about a week or so ago, I think. And by and large, those are changes that have been asked for by the town manager. Uh, not everyone, but uh, the most important ones. And those are the things that, that we need to review. Uh, Nate provided a summary in his note about the meeting. Um, before I go to that, I just wanted to note that um, there's probably a little bit more information than was in the prior draft about the project background, um, the descriptions of the East Street and Belchertown Road sites. I don't know if anybody has any questions about any of that before we go to the more critical issues. Uh, one other thing that caught my eye which we didn't have before is that there's reference to the two buildings on the Belchertown Road site. And basically it says that the developer is responsible for determining whether they'll re reuse, removal or demolition. Although that is expected to be done in concert with the town. Um, so that's new. Um, I don't think it's particularly critical but I thought I, I would mention it in case anybody has any questions about that. I thought I, maybe I made this up. I thought I noticed sometime that it, somewhere in there that it suggested that one of those buildings was so old that it might have to be reviewed by the historical commission or something. Mm -hmm. Is that true or did I make it up? I can't find no, it right it's, now. It's the, <laughs> it says that they may want it to have it um, uh, reviewed by the by the historical yeah there it is yeah it's there yeah you weren't. but do they do they have to i mean i guess my question is is that a thing that could be in the way like you can't take this building down yet even though you want to because the historical commission has to review it or is is that a, a roadblock or could that be a roadblock i just was wondering i if it is, it is, I guess, because that's true, apparently. Yeah, no, the building's pretty old, so the commission could put a 12-month delay, but the, um, you know, if it's a comprehensive permit that, you know, the applicant would request to waive that provision of the bylaw, so, um, you know, but the demolition delay bylaws, you know, would apply to this building, so it's, al it's always going to be there as a review mechanism. Okay, so that so that's just something that we missed when we did it, I guess, because we didn't notice how old it is. Oh no, I mean we. I know. I think we. I. I don't know. I think staff was aware that the you know the assessor's card says like a 1930s cape, so it was we're always aware that the property was an older building. Oh, okay. I just did. I don't remember going through it in in what we were looking at. And probably, of, right. of course, it was a 1930 building. It always was, but I didn't notice at least that that was a thing that make, it makes sense to say it here to me if that's an issue, but I don't think we had said it in so many words oh, before. Right, right. That's all. Yeah, I mean, I can share my screen and we can just go right through the document, John, if that's easier. Okay. Um, yeah, we can look at some of the specific provisions. I think there are only three that we uh, need to take a look at. So uh, Erica says she has a few, you know, she can't, she can't, she can hear us, right? But she somehow can't communicate out. And um, so Eric, if you're hearing this, you could always try quitting Zoom and trying to log back in, uh, you know, or sometimes when this happens, I have to like restart my whole computer, but maybe just quitting Zoom and starting all over would help. I don't know. I don't, <laughs> all right, she said, all right. It's too bad. My, it, like, I was just, I think, it, I don't know who I told recently, my wife started a new job and she was meeting her like 20 person team through Zooms and she had the same problem Erica has right now. So she had to email someone and say, it's not working. And 20 minutes later, the IT person was, I was basically like, well, she called me and like, just restart your computer and it worked. But the IT person had to like go into like her video settings and do all this stuff. And I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> her IT just asked, have you rebooted? And then it's like, 
<clears throat> until you do that, they don't even entertain a um, <laughs> anything else. Yeah. All right, so I can share my screen. We can just go through the document. I think that's probably you know uh, pretty easy. Um, see, all the changes are in uh, in a different color. So I don't know if it's red here. If that's is that is that legible to people? Yeah, for me. Yeah. So you yep. know, the, you know, the town will lease the property just to say a convey lease is some pretty similar. Um, the new one here is you know a submission two step requirement and that's in part because later on in the document we say that the East Street School building is required to be um, reused and so the thought was to have a letter of intent uh, 30 days after a site visit and you know then depending on what what happens with those letters of intent for instance if no one submits one <laughs> we might amend the RFP or you know figure out what to do so that means you know if we don't receive anything that means people aren't interested in that uh, requirement. So it just became, you know, this is like a two-step process now. And, um, you know, I think that's the best solution. It could give us time to amend the, the document. Yeah, the value of that is we don't have to wait 90 days to see if we get uh, submissions in response to the RFP. If we know within 30 days that people have or have not submitted letters of intent, um, then we will know pretty well where we stand and can determine whether or not, as Nate just said, we need to make uh, changes to the RFP. So, uh, Well, so, that makes me feel maybe a little bit better about the fact that the thing now demands the reuse of the building, which to me is a mistake, but at least there's a way out of it, I guess, by somebody having to, by getting no responses and then you have to go back and then you assume you know why you got no responses? It seems well, kind of, The town know. can reach out, but um, yeah, I mean, the town manager really would like to try to see the building saved. And so you know, that's, this is kind of the way to structure it. Um, there's probably other ways, but it could get a little more complicated. Um, this might be the most straightforward way. Yeah, and if we don't get responses, as Nate said, we can query um, the people who have been requested uh, or asked to bid potentially and try to determine why they didn't bid. Mm -hmm. um, but we certainly don't want to be at a place where um, we don't get any bidders. Right. That yeah. would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I, I confess to wishing that um, Paul was here so he could tell us why he so much wants to reuse the building. Well, you know, staff met with him. Um, I met with him and Dave and Rob a few times and, you know, he, you know, he thinks there's value in the building. So, you know, the, he did say he came, you know, he has some somewhat of a preservation background. And so he just, you know, uh, he, he wants to just see if there's some creativity out there to do that. Um, I mean, you know, it's a it's a contributing structure in the East Village National Register District. So he was saying, well, you know, the, the building, it's not as if it's something that, you know, and I, I think some of it is the Historical Commission has already kind of indicated they would probably issue a 12 month delay on that building, you know, more so than some others in town or other properties. So, you know, there is already, an, you know, there would be some inconsistency with the, you know, if the town manager or others said, let's take it down. I mean, for instance, the trust wants to take it down and the commission right now, probably the historical commission would probably say, let's not take it down. And so it's hard to no. meet the middle here with different interests. Um, okay. Nate, well, I, just, I, I don't see Erica's come back. No, Will joined us, but yeah. I haven't seen Erica yet either. Um, there is a product web page and you know, not everything I is will. out there. And uh, I did get emailed last week a number of documents for the property. So I, I um, just received that on Friday from different people. So I have to, you know, that can be uploaded. Um, there's nothing else that's changed so far in the document. Is here. that the one about the, I, I looked for the one, is Nate, the one about uh, the dump hazardous waste removal or something that was referred to, I couldn't find, but is it there now? No, it's not there. Um, I did, that's but, that's one of the documents that was emailed to me on Friday. So I don't. Okay. It's just you know it has to be built to um, to include everything. Yeah. Uh, just 
With respect to the letter of intent, there's actually a little bit more information about it and what's required of a potential bidder on page 13. So we'll come back to that issue when, when, uh, when we reach page 13. Yeah. yeah, we're saying the town is responsible for fixing the culvert issue on the E Street School site. So there's a, you know, a, the wetland scientists identified a damaged or failing culvert. Um, you know, yeah, just a little bit more about the building that has a newer roof and, and uh, gutters. Um, and then, you know, this cost estimate. So we did have the materials tested and then we had another contractor, I think it was Abide, actually then run a cost estimate based on all the samples. And they came up with like a square foot cost uh, based on materials and where, where it was located in the building. So I think it was about 70,000 or something. So it was a pretty accurate estimate from a contractor that often does the work. Um, and people should understand that those costs would be, or much of those costs would be incurred uh, even if the building was gonna be demolished is because you can't just take the building down and take it to the dump. You have to remove those hazardous materials first. Um, so if not all, then at least some of those costs would be uh, required of the developer, even if the building is not going to be reused. Right. Erica, if you, you've joined us again, hopefully it works, but um, uh, maybe it hasn't. The, um, what else? We, Maybe she could try just calling him. Okay, I don't yeah, know. We did mention the gas moratorium here. Um, just because I actually don't think that it, there will be any new connections. So even on the Belchertown Road, there's gas to the site. And we were told that they wouldn't, um, they're not, they wouldn't do anything with it. So, um, um the town's right to recreational lands. <clears throat> we try to make it a little bit, try to explain that it doesn't have to be a, you know, like a straight shot, that it could be, you know, it could be a flexible way to get to that back portion of the East Street School site. Um, you know, but that the public would need to get back there. And so we'll see how, you know, how, what kind of response we get in terms of how, you know, getting allowing public access to the back of the property. It's something we've always considered, but Um, at Belcher Town Road, like John said, we're, we're, we, you know, it's up to the developer to decide what to do with the structures. There's two houses, um, you know, we're not prescribing anything. So they kind of, they have to propose what they'd like to do. Um, and here's, you know, new things about the building here, you know, there's one paragraph that says the developer will be responsible for the reuse. However, the town expects that the developer will work with the town to explore alternatives. And so the town, you know, the thought here is that even if a developer is selected, there'll be many months before anything happens. And so the town would continue to see if there's a, a way to move the building or do something with it other than demolish it. But that's the newer building, right? Nate? Uh, any building actually. Either building. Okay. Either building. Yeah. I mean, the newer one, would probably be easier, but, um, you know, I, I had reached out to Habitat many months ago and I was going to do that again and others, but it's not, you know, it's not as simple as let's just pick up the house and move it. <laughs> Maybe for some people it is, but. <laughs> it is a modular house. I recall uh, Rob saying. So that yeah, might... even then, I mean, it'd be easier to move it in one piece as opposed to taking it apart. It might be like five pieces. And then, um, you know, it has to be a place to go, right? To put it, um, everything. So it's a, uh, but anyway, so yeah, there's uh, in the two houses. I mean, the older house, actually the Cape has been rented and it's, it's that's actually been more used than the house in the back, the newer one. Um, you know, the, the tenants, are, you know, the tenants are gone now, but. Um, you know, cost permits with the you know parenthetical s there's still the idea that it could be one permit for both properties it could be two different permits it really depends on i guess the developer and what they they decide so let me stop you for a minute nate did the yeah. process of um the tenants moving out of that older house cost us anything 
No, is I did the, I did a little research, and so their lease when they signed the lease, um, I don't know a while ago, uh, as of October fifteenth, twenty twenty or 2020, 2019, they were supposed to give notice uh, if they're going to stay or not. And the, the lease was pretty clear and said that if we don't hear from you, then it's, it's you know, because they indicated when the tenant signed the lease um, a year ago that the owner didn't want to rent as of July 1st this year, the owner was going to just stop leasing the building anyways. And so um, we heard from Rob and I worked with Kendrick and there are some emails where the, they said that the tenants uh, didn't opt to renew their lease. So there's never, they, they knew when they signed the lease uh, that the property was not going to be, they couldn't renew. So the town's purchase of it was happened months after that. So, that, you know, this was. Okay. So it didn't cost us anything. Erica, if you have questions, um, I, I assume you chat. can hear me, put them in the chat. And then, you know, <clears throat> the Belchertown Road site, like Rita said, it can go up to 100% AMI. And, you know, so that's typically above the 80%, but depending on how it's permitted, all the units could be counted on the subsidized housing inventory. So it's just clarification. Yeah, that's typically the way the state does things. Mm -hmm. For example, in Rolling Green, there are only 41 affordable units but the entire development of 204, 205 units are all counted in the state subsidized housing inventory. Right, oh, here's the chat. Um, all right. The, um, we did add a little bit more in terms of energy um, efficiency. I took out a few things, um, but we do have, you know, this, a little more detailed list here. So, you know, something worth discussing. If, I guess my question was uh, that those things are fine, I guess, but if they're here, should they not also then be in the comparative criteria? We tried to do that with all the other stuff. Yeah, if, we approve, if we approve this tonight, I think that would make sense, Carol. You know, the comparative criteria has been slightly updated, but not, um, yeah, it hasn't included these things. And so, you know, Erica did say, you know, the passive, is it, would this be considered a passive house? Like, do we actually want to say that or just have this list of four or five things? Um, you know, I think, I think it was still a question. Um, what are we saying? I mean, some of them are not, for instance, like, <clears throat> yeah, we're saying highly advantageous maintenance, so we're not saying they're required. Um, yep, and there's a few more below what you have on the screen too, Nate. Uh, no, I think those have all been, uh, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, like um, <laughs> this one's still, kind of, this is something I think that Trust could discuss, this uh, inclusion of um, uh, dual head electric vehicle charging stations. So, we're, so it's kind of, it's in either or right now, it says two level dual heads or depending on the number of units, it could be a required ratio. So, you know, do we just leave it at that or do we, how do we, what do you, what does the trust think about this one? Um, I think one of the issues here, which came up in the uh, forum on uh, sustainability and affordable housing is that we don't want to build a building that in five or 10 years has to have substantial renovations in order to meet the town's climate goals. Um, now, it's possible that between now and the time that the successful developer uh, applies to DHCD for subsidy money, that the DHCD requirements represented in a document called the QAP will have changed to push further in this direction. Uh, for people who did go to the uh, sustainability forum, uh, it was interesting that there was someone from state government talking about this. Um, she does not work for DHCD, but a sister state agency 
And the sum of what she said is DHCD is not moving fast enough. <laughs> so <laughs> it's hard to know exactly what to expect. Um, and I guess I also don't know uh, what these various pieces will cost the developer above and beyond um, you know, what they're able to finance. It may be it, it all works out. I just don't know. But I think it's good to have them in. Yeah, I mean, what about the dual head charging stations, though? You know, I guess to me, that's something that, you know, I don't, I think the energy efficient building stuff could be, you know, um, I think that's fine. It's not a requirement. It's highly advantageous. And we're, you know, uh, but this one is a must, you know, include the, the vehicle charging stations. I just. Um, wouldn't we want it um, at least one at, at both locations? So I think probably a ratio is better. You could you could you could say um, you know one for, per ten units or whatever it is, or one per twenty units um, in each location, something like that. Yeah, I, I agree. I also agree with the ratio. I mean, the reality of the situation is more and more these cars companies are going to go electric. You know, some of them are going electric by next year. Um, you know, higher end, lower end, lots of it. So, you know, based on what John said, you know, you don't want to build something that you'll have to do a lot of add-ons or, you know, new construction and all that. So I think a ratio would be something that we should we should strive for. Nate, I, my recollection is this was probably something that was recommended by Stephanie. Right. Stephanie Ciccarello was the town sustainability officer. Right. Um, did Stephanie have a recommended ratio? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she does. I just put one for every 20 units. Uh, and, you know, I, we, I can go back to her and just see if, you know, what, you know, maybe she wanted the trust to consider something, but I didn't. There was never any mention of what the ratio is or what the, you know, I'm sure there's a number of ratios, but. Um. And I, th I think it should be um, each, each um, location should be considered separately. So, so if there's 34 units at, at East Street, then there should be one or whatever. Yep. And if there's another, 20 units or 30 units, the other one, there should be one there or two or whatever it turns out to be. Right, right. But, but you can't put both, you can't count one at East Street and put them both at Belcher Town Road or whatever. Yeah, there. that's what Nate has. That makes Rob. sense. He, he has one unit for every 20 units for each property. Okay. Yeah. Or each know. property. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, we can see where that goes. Um, yeah, all right. I think that. You know, um, North Square had it, uh, has them, and uh, you know, others are trying to add them. How many do they have, Nate? They might have two, two dual heads. I think that's it, like four total. So four. And but the, and they have what, one hundred and twenty-eight total units. Yeah, I mean, during the permitting, it was discussed as you know, there was a big discussion about how many, what was the demand for that, and so. You know, they had said they'd be willing to put more in in the future if the demand was there. So I think, you know, there was a, I think the permitting um, didn't want to require, you know, like eight dual had two, you know, you know, like, an, you know, a large amount, but there was a discussion about how, the ability to add more in the future. So I think we went a little low at first just to know, you know. Does anybody know if you have, you know, at least one there? it makes it easier to set up a second or a third. That's what I was wondering, yeah. You have to, you have to pre-plan, I guess, as long as you have like the, if they ran conduit and everything, then it makes it easier. You know, because I think the idea was that they were going to have two near each other and then in the row of parking, it could just become like a bank of stations. So they, I think they plan for it, you know, in this certain area of the parking, but. Um, right, that's what I assumed, but 
So if you want to put in another one that's side by side with the ones that are already there, right. if you already have, as you said, the electrical conduit coming through, mm -hmm. it may be a fairly simple matter to set up a third or a fourth or a fifth. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's, you know, I used, to, I used to think, oh, this is great, but you can't just, it's not like free. I think you have to, yeah, you have to, sometimes they, they're based on membership or certain ways the charging stations work. So it's not like you can just uh, come in and just charge your car for free, but it's, you know, it's still pretty nice. How does the town charging station work behind town hall? I think it's the same thing. I forget what, uh, I don't know what it is now, but originally we were using, um, you know, like a program, you get a card. Okay. And so I think at first it was free actually, but then we went to um, a program where you have to be like a member. Uh, you might be able to pay like a one-time use fee, but I'm not, that, I don't know what it is now if that's changed, but originally that's the way it was. Okay. Should we make that uh, covered outdoor bike racks? Um, we do have winter here. <laughs> yeah, that becomes a structure. I don't know. I mean, do we require that or is that something a developer would opt to do? I don't know. Well, it's preferred amenities, so it doesn't absolutely have to be a requirement, but I think it would clearly be better if the uh, uh, outdoor bike racks were covered. They are covered. I mean, well, I guess the difference is what's there, I guess, Bike storage to me implies that there's um, that there it's a in a in a building or you know it's more than just a rack, right? Is that okay? Is, I yeah. don't know. Am I reading that too much into that? If someone said bike storage, what do you what do we? But think? it says but it says bike storage and outdoor bike racks. So yeah. it's saying two different things. And the outdoor mm -hmm. bike racks, it doesn't say anything about whether. I mean, maybe they should be covered. They just have a roof or something. Yeah, so if we say bike storage and outdoor bike racks, are we, to me, the bike storage then would be either inside or inside a shed where you could actually mm -hmm. store your bike as opposed to like a bike rack. A, a UMass bike storage is inside in the basement and then we put the hooks on so where the students can store their bikes if they're not using it right. during the winter, for example, right? And bike racks is usually where you put it when you're utilizing it during the day or two or three times, two to three times a week, let's say that. So right. there is definitely a difference. Um, some of our bike racks are covered, others are not. So depends. Yeah, I feel like with the bike storage option, we don't need covered bike racks necessarily because that could always be an option, right? I mean, I'm just thinking about 132 Northampton Road when they discussed the bike storage all of a sudden it was oh let's do a covered covered bike storage and became oh that's a structure and what about lighting and you know it wasn't like oh let's just put up a little you know whatever it became a thing that they had to have you know designed and cited and you know <laughs> I mean it wasn't like oh let's just put up like a pergola or something it's like oh now it has to have a security and lighting and electrical and so I don't I don't know if we want to push that if we have if we if we're saying we have the ability to have like internal bike storage yeah i see your point i i think we can let it go for at this point yeah and so in jay here's the the big change was deleting quite a bit about the school and just saying that require that the building be reused and incorporated into plans and you know just describes that 30 days after the site tour there'd be a letter of intent submitted um And if we don't get any letters, then, well. <laughs> um, we're not requiring an on-site management office. I think originally the RFP had said that, but I think we're just saying that it's an option just so, you know, depending on who, who is the developer, they may have another office in town or a regional office. They may not necessarily need, you know, we don't necessarily need to require an office on one or both properties. So, um, are people comfortable with dropping the requirement that there be at least one office? 
I thought last time, um, two meetings ago, we had talked about at least having one office on one of the sites. I remember us talking about that, but I didn't see it on this actually. It, it, what part of it says that one of the houses could be used uh, on the Belchertown Road, one of the houses could be used as um, right. a rental office or something like that, right? It does, right. I think it says that, yeah. I think we're, you know, we're saying it could be, but we're not making it a requirement. Right, you're not making it a requirement, correct. But I thought we had said that we wanted yeah. one that would yeah, say both sides. Yeah, what, <clears throat> what Nate just said was maybe somebody doesn't need an on-site one because they have another office in town, but this doesn't even require that. Maybe their office is in Springfield, I mean, who right. knows? So correct. it's not, it seems Can like, go ahead. I was just gonna say, looking at the language, it says ideally both sites would have a community room. So I guess that's to me, say, wondering, you know, if a tenant has to meet with somebody on site and one of our strong preferences is that there's property management with a strong relationship building process with tenants. Like, where is that gonna happen? If we're saying ideally there's a community room, there doesn't have to be an office. Like where where are we going to meet with tenants and build strong relationships if there's not an office or a community room like what what are we at under the covered bike rack or yeah i mean yeah. i mean erica said, typed in that she thought there was we you know the trust had agreed that there would be an office on site um so. for you know tenant discussions or anything like that so um you know would we say that there'd be must be one an on-site management uh, at least just one at one on site management between the properties or something. I mean, unless, I, think unless that, I think there should be at least one. And given that the two sites are only half a mile apart, you know, it's pretty easy walking distance. That should be sufficient. And that's what we had discussed one for the would serve both. Yeah. I mean, do you have like an unless they have an office in town? I mean, what if, you know, for instance, like what if Beacon were to do this and they had an office at Rolling Green, they had North Square, they'd be like, I don't really want to put a third in, uh, in here. Or do we still want to have an office, an on-site office? Can you say, <clears throat> unless they have another office within a mile? I don't know. I mean, they just say something because otherwise they can have no office, no anywhere. So it either has to be, it seems to me, it should either be that there must be one at one of the sites unless there, unless the man at property manager has another office within X distance of the two sites, a mile or How something. Far is rolling green from Belchertown Road. Is it, is it a mile or more? Anybody have a good estimate? That's probably more than a mile, actually. I don't know. Well, if you, no, unless you're a crow. <laughs> From Belchertown Road, probably it'll be a little well, less. So what if we just left it at this? It must include one on-site management office, and we'll just see what happens. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I think that's what we should have. Yeah. And I, did it change? I, I might remember wrong, but I thought I remembered that we had that there should be community room, not just there was a suggestion of some community rooms. I think that the way I read the language, Carol, is that there should be at least one community room, but ideally there would be one on each site. That's okay. Not way, that's not what it says. What does it say? Like, where is it? It says ideally both sites will include a community room, but before it didn't say it. Before this statement was included with the on site management office, so it was a. Uh, the sentence said the development must incorporate an on site management office and it include a community room. And it was unclear. Um, but if we want to change that to say the development must include one community room. And ideally, both sites would have one. I think that's what I thought we were trying to say. So what? let's say it. <laughs> I don't know where it is. Uh, Nate, but, where is yeah, that? Can but you right go now, to it wherever calls that for is? one community room for each site, right, Nate? Doesn't it I'm, call for that? 
I'm right here, so. Oh, there it is, okay. It just says ideally oh, both sites will include a community room, but to me that's just a, uh, that's the highly advantageous piece. It's not a requirement. Well, I think it should be advantageous to include at least one community room and then highly advantageous is both sites. But do we want to say that the development mu must include one? So it's, you know. Yep. That's my sense of what the group sort of uh, pushed for when we discussed this in the past, that there would be at least one community room. Um, but if the developer could put one of these sites, that would be better. Sure, so the development must include at least one community room and ideally both sites will include a community room. And then we can work each better. Site, that. Maybe, maybe it would say each site will include I don't know. Anyway, whatever. You know, this and I, the advantageous piece would just be incorporated into the criteria. Yeah, I, I, you can wordsmith it a little bit later, but I think that the. Yeah, that's fine. That this is True. fine. All right. Yeah, Erica said she thinks that it would be really important to have one on both sides, but I think that, you know, we can leave it here for now and. Um, you know, this is kind of just reiterating what was above with the letter of intent. It says, you know, we have 30 days from the site tour and the letter will provide a clear understanding and willingness to pursue the reuse of the building. And so, you know, there's a little bit more below we will get to. Um, we didn't change the bedroom count or, you know, mix. Um, we clarified the land development agreement piece just, just says that the developer will work with the town to explore relocating the structures that are on Belchertown Road now. And we're still requiring a minimum of 40 affordable units between both sites. So, you know, that's, that's, that's what could be the minimum. Yeah, I think that should be the minimum. Yeah. We deleted under construction obligations, you know, demolition of the building, which, you know, that could be reinserted if needed. Um, just clarified a little bit about the 100% AMI on Belchertown Road because of use of CPA funds. Hold on, on this, on this um, section, paragraph two, mm -hmm. underneath, underneath the part where that's been changed, yep. there's a clause there that doesn't really make sense. It's it's, what? It's the maximum monthly amounts that may be charged for an affordable unit under this clause, comma, the developer shall include an allowance. It doesn't, I think there's a, something missing there. Oh, yeah. maybe there's a period here. Just something like that. The, no, 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 the no, maximum. I think, I think, um, I think oh, it's yeah. supposed to say that may be charged, maximum monthly rent yeah. that may be charged is. X or, or is 100% of the fair market value or fair, fair market for um, rent charge to tenants must be an equal amount of 3% um, of the monthly just in the so uh, uh, Oh, yeah. So I think this one um, would be, yeah, I actually think this should be moved to go to here. Say my okay. national monthly rent shall include an allowance for utilities. Okay, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the rents are pretty high. I, I'm getting a spreadsheet together for inclusionary zoning, and it's pretty amazing actually what an affordable rent is. It's, I don't want to say it's not affordable, but it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Uh, let's see what else. 
we have a 99 year. So, you know, the town, if we lease the property, what we do, like we did on Olympia Oaks, you know, would be a lease, a 99 year lease, a uh, ground lease to the developer. Um, and under additional funds, we just mentioned that we have, you know, CPA funds and tax incentive financing, just that they're available. The developer may apply for them. So for the letter of intent, we say that it would include three things, a clear understanding of the design costs and implications for rehabilitating the school, um, identif identification and description of the project team, including partners um, who would assist with the reuse and identification of two uh, funding sources. And so something that would just show that they're, you know, if anyone is interested, they have the, and they put together a team and understand what's that, what, you know, what it actually means to do that. Yeah. I mean, the most important is that first one where right. the developer has to acknowledge that they understand that they are required if they go forward um, with rehabilitating the East Street School Building. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we just reinserted the 10% of Shelby three or more bedrooms. That's just repeated from up above. Um, the comparative criteria we can insert here, it's, we have it. Um, and the letter of intent, we're just saying submitted to Anthony Delaney, the procurement officer, just like the proposal. Uh, that reminds me of a, Another sort of question. Sure. I'm remembering that um, people thought that last time there were questions that Anthony Delaney didn't answer and we didn't even know that they hadn't been answered and we were gonna try to have some way to make sure that the trust knows uh, the communication that Anthony gets so that that doesn't happen again. And I wondered how, how that's supposed to happen or if that's supposed to happen. <laughs> Where yeah, is that concern? I yeah, I think we would just, I think, um, you know, I think before or when this is getting ready to be issued by the town, we could just, you know, I think there's an internal discussion about what's the communication process because Anthony, Anthony's really kind of like the clearinghouse, right? He doesn't necessarily answer the questions. He might have to email myself or the wetland um, um, specialist or DPW or someone in the town. So really, you know, he's just he's helping to get the questions directed to the right person and so i think um i think just no i think just having that discussion about like you know always copy me and someone else ever anytime a question comes in like just you know in that way it, we know that it's um that they're there can, can we require the developer to copy you or to copy the uh chair of the housing trust uh, let me just actually, let's just, let me make a note. Um, let me just make a note right here about copying. Um, another staff person on all communication. Let me just make that. We could probably do that. We can make that request. That way we just, you know, right, I can ask. Um, you know, this was still everything that the, you know, that the trust and everyone developed. Uh, for the development team, scrolling a little fast here, we had at one point change it to um, requiring that they have 40B experience. The developer itself, and now we're saying the development team shall demonstrate successful experience in permitting projects through 40B. So that way it's not just the, you know, someone on their team would have, would need to have experience with the 40B process. So, you know, it doesn't have to be the developer or, uh, you know, but at least someone on their team would. Um, and Erica asked about the letter of intent. Yeah, it is really just an affirmation that they understand the process of reusing the school. So just, we, we talked about that, but just wanna make sure. Um, development financing. None of this has changed. I don't know if there's any other comments. Um, 
the letters of intent, you know, it just has town staff will review them. Really, it's, you know, if they, if we, if so, if a developer, if an applicant submits one, then, you know, essentially if they meet those three criteria, they're, you know, then they move on to submitting a full proposal. But if they don't, you know, if no one submits or, or staff thinks that it's not sufficient, then, you know, we have to decide what to do with the process. But there are some requirements that presumably they don't start working in RFP until they hear back, yes, your letter has been accepted, right? Or something like that. Right. I mean, yeah. if, they're really, if they're really serious about it, they might already start, you know, doing- Well, right, but I mean, they don't officially, yeah. Right. So, I mean, this does, you know, this would push out the timeline. So we discussed about having like a 90 day response uh, time as opposed to like 45 days or 60 days. It would actually be a, a longer window for, you know, from the time this was published to the time that a full proposal would be due. Nate, what if only one potential bidder responds with a letter of intent? Is the town right. comfortable with going forward with only a single bidder? I don't know. <laughs> Why wouldn't they, if it was yeah. a good, if it was a good proposal, why wouldn't you be satisfied? No, I, I was gonna, well, I was you don't. That if, it, if it's someone who seems like they are really serious about it, then the town would probably entertain it. I mean, you know, it, at that it would point, be fine with me. I just wondered whether the town would have any reservations. No, I think it really depends on how well the letter, you know, does it meet the criteria because. In the end, the town's, you know, isn't at a position to stop the process and we'd have to get a full proposal to determine whether or not um, we want to, you know, at that point, accept or reject it, so. Well, if you have only one, are there requirements about how you deal with the competitive criteria? Because if, if there's only one letter of intent and then the RFP you get never gets above the minimum requirements for anything, but always hits the minimum requirements. Do you have to award the project? No. no. Okay, no. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the idea hopefully would be that if there's only one uh, applicant at the letter of intent stage that they would follow through and have a full proposal and they would, you know, um, you know it's. it's it's time and money and effort for them too, right? So my thought is they would do the best they could to, to, to you know, submit a proposal. Is, is the number of letters of intent that the town receives a matter of public record prior to the conclusion of the procurement? Good question. Yeah, it might not be. It might be all considered one procurement process. So until we get the actual proposals, the letters of intent are uh, are not public. That's a good question for the lawyer, probably. Yeah, let me just type it in right here. I, I, I I'm kind of I'm thinking actually that they. This might be considered one procurement process and so that the letters wouldn't be public until right. we determine the process is over. That's fine, I'm just asking. Yeah, no, it's a good one. Oh, my typing. Okay. Um, and you know, the town manager, I think Carol, you asked this earlier, like what what's the process or who you know, who has the authority over this. So, you know, it's a town property, the school uh, committee voted that it was, um, you know, they essentially um, disposed of it or transferred the rights to the town. And so it's under the care and custody of the town manager. So the town manager, you know, with advice from staff and the trust would put it, would, and legal counsel and the procurement officer would finalize the RFP. And then it's also the town manager who decide a review committee so, you know, there could be up to, I don't know, I'd say three to five people who would review proposals. Um, usually don't want to go more than five. <laughs> would that committee be formed in order to review the letters of intent? No. Or just staff. the letter or just the proposals? Yeah, just the proposals. Um, 
I'm not sure if Thiago is scrolling down. There wasn't, I'm not sure how many, uh, I think that's really it. Those are the changes. Um, yeah, I think that's that's everything that I saw. Yeah. Okay, well, at our last meeting, we voted uh, unanimously, I think it was six people attending, to accept the prior draft. So we need to have a vote to decide whether or not to accept these changes. Um, yeah. we can just do the entire revised draft, uh, or we could take it kind of subject by subject and see if everybody is comfortable with uh, the letter of intent, with the requirement for reuse of the E Street School, with the sustainability requirements and with any of the other changes that are represented here. So do people want to talk about these issue by issue or uh, just do really a single vote? <laughs> Erica makes the motion to accept all changes. Um. <laughs> Okay, so there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second to Erica's motion? I'll second, I, I agree. Okay, uh, Sid seconds. Okay, so we're at the point where, is there any discussion? Is there anybody who feels concerned enough about any of these changes uh, or all of these changes that would cause them to uh, vote against the motion? I just have a, I think, a clarifying question. I assume that because some of the changes here will trigger changes in the criteria, that if we vote to accept this, we're voting that the criteria will be changed to match this, that that's part and parcel of what we're saying. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, there's only two criteria that are affected. One has to do with the design concept and Nate's already adjusted that one to take into account reuse of the E Street School. The other one is the sustainability requirements. And I think we already discussed that it's our expectation that those would be changed to include the uh, elements that we've already discussed in this meeting and that are in this redraft. So okay. is, that's sufficient, Carol? Yes, thank you. Other questions or comments? I'd say that I, I agree with Carol's earlier point that um, I think it's a bad idea to require the E Street School to be saved. I think it's going to it's going to potentially delay the process and and possibly not get the best design. But I'm I'm not going to stand in the way of accepting the RFP because of that. I. I also have reservations, Rob. I'd be lying if I said I didn't. Um, I think those, for me at least, have been satisfied with the notion that we require the letter of intent. It must be submitted within 30 days of the RFP. The potential bidders have an opportunity to see all the relevant documents and to actually walk through the school itself at least once. And if at the end of 30 days, we don't get uh, sufficient interest or any interest, then we've lost 30 days and perhaps a bit more, but it's not as much as we would lose if we had to wait 90 days to see if proposals come in. I think though that, I think though that we might um, waste time. We might get two people, two, Developers saying, "Yeah, I can work with that." In 30 days, my my evaluation is that we can work with that. Then 60 days later, they say, "Oh, I, I really couldn't come up with a proposal that makes it work." So now we've wasted 90 days, and now we have to we have to you know reissue it. Um, I agree. There's I, that risk. Um, I, I, um, 
I will say that we reached out to three potential not-for-profit developers on this issue and asked them their opinion. And in every case, I'm talking about Wayfinders, Home City Housing, and Valley Community Development. They did not think it was a good idea to make this a requirement. Um, but to be honest, we're kind of at loggerheads with the town manager at the moment. Yeah. And so my inclination is to say, okay, let's see what happens with these letters of intent um, and, and then go forward there. That's fine. I guess I still have one reservation and that is that the letters, of, I would don't think I would be especially happy if there were only one letter of intent. If one person thinks they can do it this way by saving the school and we have immediately automatically crossed out the other two people say who could do a really good job by not saving the school, then that's bad. I don't think that's a good situation. So at least I want, and before, before we go clearly with only people who will do it this way, I want at least two letters of intent. My two cents. But I think we might only get one full proposal anyways. And so I think, you know, that's, that's a, to me, that's a somewhat unrealistic way to do it because then we'd have to say, then we'd have to at least have two proposals. What if there's two letters of intent, but only one person, one applicant follows through with a proposal and that, that often happens. And so then the town, you know, there is a decision-making point where the town could say, we don't have enough information or it's not competitive, right? Because we only had one response, but we have to at least get to that point. Um, and so what if, I mean, I just if there's only, that, if only one proposal, I'm just saying two letters of intent and then whatever happens happens, but at least you start out with the possibility of two people who think they might be willing to try to do this or who think they can do this, understand what they're trying to do and have the intention of doing it. But I, I'm not, I, I don't know what I'm, I don't know how I vote, but it, but it, but it does, it really, it's a concern of wasting time and also ending up with what, to me, ending up with something that might be, uh, less than the best that we could have gotten out of the properties if we hadn't made that demand. All you need is one good developer. <laughs> really, at the end of the day. Well, um, that's right. But so, do you know that the good one is the one who's going to say they're going to try to save the building? That's well, the only question. Yeah. Or my question. You know, I think having those other requirements in the letter of intent um, and the you know, the, the trust and the town have the right to pull the RFP at any point if they okay. felt that the one letter of intent was inadequate. You know, there are provisions within kind of standard language um, that the town could withdraw. Now, it's not something that you wanna do, but if you felt that you had a really inadequate developer who submitted the one letter of intent, then the town could decide not to go forward. Yeah. Also, if I okay. mean, again, this is not ideal, but if we only get one letter of intent and one proposal, if the proposal is inadequate, um, then the town is not obligated to go forward to accept that proposal. Right. So I understand your reservation, Carol, um, but uh, I, I think the letter of intent is our best hedge against the risk of uh, not finding uh, one or more developers who can do a decent job and incorporate the school into their planning. Carol, just yep. as a no, I'm going to type in your comment um, just to share back with staff. So, uh, uh, Erica asked if, you know, John, Rita, and Nate, are you reviewing the letters of intent? 
and part of the decision making process. So I think it's just staff right now that would review the letters of intent. I think the idea would be that if they meet those three minimum criteria, they would just, you know, just they'd move the applicant would just move right on to a full proposal process if they wanted to go. But it's not, there's no comparative review between letters of intent. It's really just an individual review of each letter that they meet the criteria. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Eric asked staff with housing development experience. Yeah, I, I hope so. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get that, Nate. Uh, Eric asked, uh, would you know staff with housing development experience review the letters? And, and I said, I hope so. You know, as opposed to say like having you know, one staff person read the letters. Well, the staff member with housing development experience is Rob Mora. Is there anybody else, Nate? I mean, like I could review it. We could have other people review it. My thought is town staff isn't, to me, it could be plural. So I'm not envisioning just, uh, you know, one staff person, but we could clarify that if we want. Okay, are we ready to come to a vote? I can see not everybody's smiling, but <laughs> that doesn't mean we're not ready to come to a vote. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna poll everybody uh, for their uh, yes or no. Erica, actually, I, you have she to says, write in the chat, yes, okay. She says yes, yeah. Rob? Yes. Will? Yes. Allegra? Yes. Sid? Yes. Uh, Carol? Uh, I guess so. <laughs> That's very <laughs> resounding affirmation. <laughs> and I vote yes. So did I miss anybody? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, so that gives us, uh, I believe, seven votes. In, oh, did I, Will, did I reach yeah. you? Yeah. Okay, so that gives us seven or eight votes. I lost count. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, you know, okay, this is great. So, so what, what this means is tomorrow, you know, I can forward this on to the town manager's office and then, um, you know, officially ask legal counsel to review it and get that, you know, get all that going. Um, okay. How long do you think before this thing hits the street and we see what's going on? Uh, that's, that, that's the decision of the town manager. I mean, I think, I, I don't, I don't know if they, you know, if there's any, um, you know, it's probably a few weeks just to um, lead time to notice it. You know, there's probably, I forget what it is, but there's to get it posted and uh, you know, it's probably like a, like a 10, 10 day lead time. So, um, you know, if we need a week to review it and then a 10 day lead time, I mean, probably end up, um, you know, it, it takes a few weeks then. Okay, well, I, I can't uh, say more than about my eagerness to um, make this available and to uh, uh, see what we get in that 30 day period. Yeah, I mean, Eric, I said end of June, my thought is somewhere around there, you know, I, I, forget, I forget how long it takes actually to post it like in the central register and bulletin and everything. I forget what the lead time is, but um... I know one has. I know one has like a ten day lead time. Like I was posted on a Wednesday to be published. Like it's like a week later on Monday or something. It's I forget what it is. But anyways, okay. I, share, I mean, some staff. I mean, staff's already seen that this. this has got you know previous version went around to a number of staff. So I think you know I think 
even with legal counsel review, my thought is the template and format that's used is really good. And so it's just a matter of having another set of eyes review it for consistency. You know, I think all the local decisions about what we went over in terms of design guidelines, affordability and everything. I mean, legal counsel may have a question about that, but really their point is to look at the, you know, the, you know, make sure everything is consistent and, and we're not somehow contradicting ourselves or you know, it's not something that's, you know, shouldn't be in there, but in terms of all the other local decisions, it's not really, to me, they're, they can look at it, but it's not like, you know, they, you know, it's not their opinion to change it, right? I mean, they can, they can say, oh, this seems like it's an odd requirement, but the trust, you know, we've discussed it enough that it's, that I think they'll agree that it's, that it's a local decision to be made. I could be wrong seeing it when the comments come back, but that's the way, when we did it previously with the East Street School, that's what, that's what happened. Yeah. yeah okay. more, more seems like sometimes it takes them a long time to do that, even if they don't have that much to do the legal review part. Yeah, but, I think, it, you know, right. I think it's going to be a matter of then the town manager really making that a you know, priority for legal to, to make that a review. Yeah. Can we request of him that he do that? Make it a priority? Sure. John said, John will remind everyone. He's good at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yay, John. Okay, and, well. and Nate, Erica was asking about the um, evaluation criteria. So are you going to do the final edit on those and then yeah. incorporate it into the? Yeah, and I'll send it around to Rita, you, you and okay. uh, John Hornick and John Page just for a final look. Okay, um, great. Yeah, it's interesting. I work on a Mac and I don't know if that's why some of the formatting, got, got, you know, then I saved it to the OneDrive. Um, and so it's, I think sometimes just like between those different, you know, softwares, it just, it can throw a monkey, a, you know, a wrench or whatever in it. And so um, yeah. I don't know what happened before, like all the different numbering and uh, the font change. Some of my fonts are not consistent <laughs> anymore. I mean, it's like little things like that, not, not big, but it's just, I, you want to get it right. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks, Nate, for all your work on this. I do appreciate it. Yeah, um, yes. Well, and you and everyone else. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. It was a Carol, Rita, Erica, right? I don't really put the effort in. Francis. Francis, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, we still have another meeting in about 10 days on Thursday, June 10th. So I'll be sending out uh, a rough agenda for that meeting uh, on Wednesday or Thursday of this week. Yeah, thanks everyone. And there's a few members in the uh, in the attendance, and so just let them know we, you know, the only topic of the agenda was just reviewing the request for a proposal, and the trust voted to forward that on. All right, I think we're good. I'll stop recording in a minute, and um, I guess. Okay. Again, thanks everybody for attending this special meeting. I appreciate.